introduction to a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott introduction the legend of montrose was written chiefly with a view to place before the reader the melancholy fate of john lord kilpont eldest son of william earl of Erith and menteith and the singular circumstances attending the birth and history of james stuart of ardverlich by whose hand the unfortunate nobleman fell our subject leads us to talk of deadly feuds and we must begin with one still more ancient than that to which our story relates during the reign of james the fourth a great feud between the powerful families of drummond and murray divided perthshire the former being the most numerous and powerful cooped up eight score of the murrays in the kirk of monaverd and set fire to it the wives and the children of the ill-fated men who had also found shelter in the church perished by the same conflagration one man named david murray escaped by the humanity of one of the drummonds who received him in his arms as he leapt from amongst the flames as king james the fourth ruled with more activity than most of his predecessors this cruel deed was severely revenged and several of the perpetrators were beheaded at stirling in consequence of the prosecution against his clan the drummond by whose assistance david murray had escaped fled to ireland until by means of the person whose life he had saved he was permitted to return to scotland where he and his descendants were distinguished by the name of drummond irinach or ernoch that is drummond of ireland and the same title was bestowed on their estate the drummond ernoch of james the sixth time was a king's forester in the forest of glenartney and chanced to be employed there in search of venison about the year fifteen eighty eight or early in fifteen eighty nine this forest was adjacent to the chief haunts of the macgregors or a particular race of them known by the title of mackay or children of the mist they considered the foresters hunting in their vicinity as an aggression or perhaps they had him at feud for the apprehension or slaughter of some of their own name or for some similar reason this tribe of macgregors were outlawed and persecuted as the reader may see in the introduction to rob roy and every man's hand being against them their hand was of course directed against every man in short they surprised and slew drummond ernoch cut off his head and carried it with them wrapped in the corner of one of their plaids in the full exultation of vengeance they stopped at the house of ardverlich and demanded refreshment which the lady a sister of the murdered drummond ernoch her husband being absent was afraid or unwilling to refuse she caused bread and cheese to be placed before them and gave directions for more substantial refreshments to be prepared while she was absent with this hospitable intention the barbarians placed the head of her brother on the table filling the mouth with bread and cheese and bidding him eat for many a merry meal he had eaten in that house the poor woman returning and beholding this dreadful sight shrieked aloud and fled into the woods where as described in the romance she roamed a raving maniac and for some time secreted herself from all living society some remaining instinctive feeling brought her at length to steal a glance from a distance at the maidens while they milked the cows which being observed her husband ardverlich had her conveyed back to her home and detained there till she gave birth to a child of whom she had been pregnant 
after which she was observed gradually to recover her mental faculties meanwhile the outlaws had carried to the utmost their insults against the regal authority which indeed as exercised they had little reason for respecting they bore the same bloody trophy which they had so savagely exhibited to the lady of ardvorlich into the old church of balquitter nearly in the centre of their country where the laird of macgregor and all his clan being convened for the purpose laid their hands successively on the dead man's head and swore in heathenish and barbarous manner to defend the author of the deed this fierce and vindictive combination gave the author's late and lamented friend sir alexander boswell bart subject for a spirited poem entitled clan alpin's vow which was printed but not i believe published in eighteen eleven the fact is ascertained by a proclamation from the privy council dated fourth february fifteen eighty nine directing letters of fire and sword against the macgregors this fearful commission was executed with uncommon fury the late excellent john buchanan of cambusmore showed the author some correspondence between his ancestor the laird of buchanan and lord drummond about sweeping certain valleys with their followers on a fixed time and rendezvous about taking sweet revenge for the death of their cousin drummond ernoch in spite of all however that could be done the devoted tribe of macgregor still bred up survivors to sustain and to inflict new cruelties and injuries i embrace the opportunity given me by a second mention of this tribe to notice an error which imputes to an individual named seer moore macgregor the slaughter of the students in the battle of glenfruin i am informed from the authority of john gregerson esq that the chieftain so named was dead nearly a century before the battle in question and could not therefore have done the cruel action mentioned the mistake does not rest with me as i disclaimed being responsible for the tradition while i quoted it but with vulgar fame which is always disposed to ascribe remarkable actions to a remarkable name see the erroneous passage rob roy introduction and so soft sleep the offended phantom of dugald sar Mor. it is with mingled pleasure and shame that i record the more important error of having announced as deceased my learned acquaintance the rev dr graham minister of aberfoyle see rob roy page three hundred sixty i cannot now recollect the precise ground of my depriving my learned and excellent friend of his existence unless like mr kirk his predecessor in the parish the excellent doctor had made a short trip to fairyland with whose wonders he is so well acquainted but however i may have been misled my regret is most sincere for having spread such a rumour and no one can be more gratified than i that the report however i have been induced to credit and give it currency is a false one and that dr graham is still the living pastor of aberfoyle for the delight and instruction of his brother antiquaries meanwhile young james stuart of ardvorlich grew up to manhood uncommonly tall strong and active with such power in the grasp of his hand in particular as could force the blood from beneath the nails of the persons who contended with him in this feat of strength his temper was moody fierce and irascible yet he must have had some ostensible good qualities as he was greatly beloved by lord kilpont the eldest son of the earl of erth and menteith this gallant young nobleman joined montrose in the setting up his standard in sixteen forty four just before the decisive battle at tippermuir on the first of september in that year at that time stuart of ardvorlich shared the confidence of the young lord by day and his bed by night 
when about four or five days after the battle ardvorlich either from a fit of sudden fury or deep malice long entertained against his unsuspecting friend stabbed lord kilpont to the heart and escaped from the camp of montrose having killed a sentinel who attempted to detain him bishop guthrie gives us a reason for this villainous action that lord kilpont had rejected with abhorrence a proposal of ardvorlich to assassinate montrose but it does not appear that there is any authority for this charge which rests on mere suspicion ardvorlich the assassin certainly did fly to the covenanters and was employed and promoted by them he obtained a pardon for the slaughter of lord kilpont confirmed by parliament in sixteen thirty four and was made major of argyle's regiment in sixteen forty eight such are the facts of the tale here given as a legend of montrose's wars the reader will find they are considerably altered in the fictitious narrative the author has endeavoured to enliven the tragedy of the tale by the introduction of a personage proper to the time and country in this he has been held by excellent judges to have been in some degree successful the contempt of commerce entertained by young men having some pretence to gentility the poverty of the country of scotland the national disposition to wandering and to adventure all conduced to lead the scots abroad into the military service of countries which were at war with each other they were distinguished on the continent by their bravery but in adopting the trade of mercenary soldiers they necessarily injured their national character the tincture of learning which most of them possessed degenerated into pedantry their good breeding became more ceremonial their fear of dishonour no longer kept them aloof from that which was really unworthy but was made to depend on certain punctilious observances totally apart from that which was in itself deserving of praise a cavalier of honour in search of his fortune might for example change his service as he would his shirt fight like the doughty captain dalgetty in one cause after another without regard to the justice of the quarrel and might plunder the peasantry subjected to him by the fate of war with the most unrelenting rapacity but he must beware how he sustained the slightest reproach even from a clergyman if it had regard to neglect on the score of duty the following occurrence will prove the truth of what i mean here i must not forget the memory of one preacher master william forbessa a preacher for soldiers yea and a captain in need to lead soldiers on a good occasion being full of courage with discretion and good conduct beyond some captains i have known that were not so capable as he at this time he not only prayed for us but went on with us to remark as i think men's carriage and having found a sergeant neglecting his duty and his honour at such a time whose name i will not express having chidden him did promise to reveal him unto me as he did after their service the sergeant being called before me and accused did deny his accusation alleging if he were no pastor that had alleged it he would not lie under the injury the preacher offered to fight with him in proof that it was truth he had spoken of him whereupon i cashiered the sergeant and gave his place to a worthier called mungo gray a gentleman of good worth and of much courage the sergeant being cashiered never called master william to account for which he was evil thought of so that he retired home and quit the wars the above quotation is taken from a work which the author repeatedly consulted while composing the following sheets and which is in great measure written in the humour of captain dugall dalgetty it bears the following formidable title monroe his expedition with the worthy scots regiment called mckee's regiment levied in august sixteen twenty six by sir donald mckee lord rees colonel 
for his majesty's service of denmark and reduced after the battle of nurling in september sixteen thirty four at worms in the pauls discharged in several duties and observations of service first under the magnanimous king of denmark during his wars against the empire afterwards under the invincible king of sweden during his majesty's lifetime and since under the director-general the rex chancellor oxenstern and his generals collected and gathered together at spare hours by colonel robert munro as first lieutenant under the said regiment to the noble and worthy captain thomas mackenzie of kildon brother to the noble lord the lord earl of seaforth for the use of all noble cavaliers favouring the laudable profession of arms to which is annexed the abridgment of exercise and diverse practical observations for the younger officer his consideration ending with the soldier's meditations on going on service london 1637 another worthy of the same school and nearly the same views of the military character is sir james turner a soldier of fortune who rose to considerable rank in the reign of charles the second had a command in galloway and dumfrieshire for the suppression of conventicles and was made prisoner by the insurgent covenanters in that rising which was followed by the battle of pentland sir james is a person even of superior pretensions to lieutenant colonel munro having written a military treatise on the pike exercise called palace armada moreover he was educated at glasgow college though he escaped to become an ensign in the german wars instead of taking his degree of master of arts at that learned seminary in latter times he was author of several discourses on historical and literary subjects from which the bannatine club have extracted and printed such passages as concerned his life and times under the title of sir james turner's memoirs from this curious book i extract the following passage as an example of how captain dalgetty might have recorded such an incident had he kept a journal or to give it a more just character it is such as the genius of defoe would have devised to give the minute and distinguishing features of truth to a fictitious narrative here i will set down an incident befell me for though it was not a very strange one yet it was a very odd one in all its parts my two brigades lay in a village within half a mile of appleby my own quarter was in a gentleman's house who was a ritmaster and at that time with sir marmaduke his wife kept her chamber ready to be brought to bed the castle being over and lambert far enough i resolved to go to bed every night having had fatigue enough before the first night i slept well enough and rising next morning i missed one linen stocking one half silk one and one boot hose the accoutrement under a boot for one leg neither could they be found for any search being provided of more of the same kind i made myself ready and rode to the headquarters at my return i could hear no news of my stockings that night i went to bed and next morning found myself just so used missing the three stockings for one leg only the other three being left entire as they were the day before a narrower search than the first was made but without success i had yet in reserve one pair of whole stockings and a pair of boot hose greater than the former these i put on my legs the third morning i found the same usage the stockings for one leg only left me it was time for me then and my servants too to imagine it must be rats that had shared my stockings so unequally with me and this the mistress of the house knew well enough but would not tell it me the room which was a low parlour being well searched with candles the top of my great boot hose was found at a hole in which they had drawn all the rest i went abroad 
and ordered the boards to be raised to see how the rats had disposed of my movables the mistress sent a servant of her own to be present at this action which she knew concerned her one board being but a little opened a little boy of mine thrust in his hand and fetched with him four and twenty old pieces of gold and one angel the servant of the house affirmed it appertained to his mistress the boy bringing the gold to me i went immediately to the gentlewoman's chamber and told her it was probable lambert having quartered in that house as indeed he had some of his servants might have hid that gold and if so it was lawfully mine but if she could make it appear it belonged to her i should immediately give it her the poor gentlewoman told me with many tears that her husband being none of the frugalest men and indeed he was a spendthrift she had hid that gold without his knowledge to make use of it as she had occasion especially when she lay in and conjured me as i loved the king for whom her husband and she had suffered much not to detain her gold she said if there were either more or less than four and twenty whole pieces and two half ones it should be none of hers and that they were put by her in a red velvet purse after i had given her assurance of her gold a new search is made and another angel is found the velvet purse all gnawed in bits as my stockings were and the gold instantly restored to the gentlewoman i have often heard that the eating or gnawing of cloths by rats is ominous and portends some mischance to fall on those to whom the clothes belong i thank god i was never addicted to such divinations or heeded them it is true that more misfortunes than one fell on me shortly after but i am sure i could have better foreseen them myself than rats or any such vermin and yet did it not i have heard indeed many fine stories told of rats how they abandon houses and ships when the first are to be burnt and the second drowned naturalists say they are very sagacious creatures and i believe they are so but i shall never be of the opinion they can foresee future contingencies which i suppose the devil himself can neither foreknow nor foretell these being things which the almighty hath kept hidden in the bosom of his divine prescience and whither the great god hath preordained or predestined these things which to us are contingent to fall out by any uncontrollable and unavoidable necessity is a question not yet decided sir james turner's memoirs bannatyne edition page fifty nine in quoting these ancient authorities i must not forget the more modern sketch of a scottish soldier of the old fashion by a master hand in the character of les mahago since the existence of that doughty captain alone must deprive the present author of all claim to absolute originality still dalgetty as the production of his own fancy has been so far a favourite with its parent that he has fallen into the error of assigning to the captain too prominent a part in the story this is the opinion of a critic who encamps on the highest pinnacles of literature and the author is so far fortunate in having incurred his censure that it gives his modesty a decent apology for quoting the praise which it would have ill befitted him to bring forward in an unmingled state the passage occurs in the edinburgh review number fifty five containing a criticism on ivanhoe there is too much perhaps of dalgetty or rather he engrosses too great a proportion of the work for in himself we think he is uniformly entertaining and the author has nowhere shown more affinity to that matchless spirit who could bring out his falstaffs and his pistols in act after act and play after play and exercise them every time with scenes of unbounded loquacity without either exhausting their humour or varying a note from its characteristic tone than in his large and reiterated specimens 
of the eloquence of the redoubted ripmaster the general idea of the character is familiar to our comic dramatists after the restoration and may be said in some measure to be compounded of captain fluellen and bobadil but the ludicrous combination of the soldado with the divinity student of marischal college is entirely original and the mixture of talent selfishness courage coarseness and conceit was never so happily exemplified numerous as his speeches are there is not one that is not characteristic and to our taste divertingly ludicrous postscript while these pages were passing through the press the author received a letter from the present robert stuart of ardverlick favouring him with the account of the unhappy slaughter of lord kilpont differing from and more probable than that given by bishop wishart whose narrative infers either insanity or the blackest treachery on the part of james stuart of ardverlick the ancestor of the present family of that name it is but fair to give the entire communication as received from my respected correspondent which is more minute than the histories of the period although i have not the honour of being personally known to you i hope you will excuse the liberty i now take in addressing you on the subject of a transaction more than once alluded to by you in which an ancestor of mine was unhappily concerned i allude to the slaughter of lord kilpont son of the earl of erith and monteith in sixteen forty four by james stuart of ardverlick as the cause of this unhappy event and the quarrel which led to it have never been correctly stated in any history of the period in which it took place i am induced in consequence of your having in the second series of your admirable tales on the history of scotland adopted weishart's version of the transaction and being aware that your having done so will stamp it with an authenticity which it does not merit and with a view as far as possible to do justice to the memory of my unfortunate ancestor to send you the account of this affair as it has been handed down in the family james stuart of ardverlick who lived in the early part of the seventeenth century and who was the unlucky cause of the slaughter of lord kilpont as before mentioned was appointed to the command of one of several independent companies raised in the highlands at the commencement of the troubles in the reign of charles i another of these companies was under the command of lord kilpont and a strong intimacy strengthened by a distant relationship subsisted between them when montrose raised the royal standard ardverlick was one of the first to declare for him and is said to have been a principal means of bringing over lord kilpont to the same cause and they accordingly along with sir john drummond and their respective followers joined montrose as recorded by wishart at Buchanty. while they served together so strong was their intimacy that they lived and slept in the same tent in the meantime montrose had been joined by the irish under the command of alexander macdonald these on their march to join montrose had committed some excesses on lands belonging to ardverlick which lay in the line of their march from the west coast of this ardverlick complained to montrose who probably wishing as much as possible to conciliate his new allies treated it in rather an evasive manner ardverlick who was a man of violent passions having failed to receive such satisfaction as he required challenged macdonald to single combat before they met however montrose on the information and by advice as it is said of kilpont laid them both under arrest montrose seeing the evils of such a feud at such a critical time effected a sort of reconciliation between them and forced them to shake hands in his presence when it was said that ardverlick who was a very powerful man took such a hold of macdonald's hand as to make the blood start from his fingers still it would appear ardverlick was by no means reconciled a few days after the battle of tippermuir 
when montrose with his army was encamped at coles an entertainment was given by him to his officers in honour of the victory he had obtained and kilpont and his comrade ardverlich were of the party after returning to their quarters ardverlich who seemed still to brood over his quarrel with macdonald and being heated with drink began to blame lord kilpont for the part he had taken in preventing his obtaining redress and reflecting against montrose for not allowing him what he considered proper reparation kilpont of course defended the conduct of himself and his relative montrose till their argument came to high words and finally from the state they were both in by an easy transition to blows when ardverlich with his dirk struck kilpont dead on the spot he immediately fled and under the cover of a thick mist escaped pursuit leaving his eldest son henry who had been mortally wounded at tippermuir on his deathbed his followers immediately withdrew from montrose and no course remained for him but to throw himself into the arms of the opposite faction by whom he was well received his name is frequently mentioned in leslie's campaigns and on more than one occasion he is mentioned as having afforded protection to several of his former friends through his interest with leslie when the king's cause became desperate the foregoing account of this unfortunate transaction i am well aware differs materially from the account given by wishart who alleges that stuart had laid a plot for the assassination of montrose and that he murdered lord kilpont in consequence of his refusal to participate in his design now i may be allowed to remark that besides wishart having always been regarded as a partial historian and very questionable authority on any subject connected with the motives or conduct of those who differed from him in opinion that even had stuart formed such a design kilpont from his name and connections was likely to be the very last man of whom stuart would choose to make a confidant and accomplice on the other hand the above account though never that i am aware before hinted at has been a constant tradition in the family and from the comparative recent date of the transaction and the sources from which the tradition has been derived i have no reason to doubt its perfect authenticity it was most circumstantially detailed as above given to my father mr stuart now of ardverlich many years ago by a man nearly connected with the family who lived to the age of one hundred this man was a great-grandson of james stuart by a natural son john of whom many stories are still current in this country under his appellation of john do more this john was with his father at the time and of course was a witness of the whole transaction he lived till a considerable time after the revolution and it was from him that my father's informant who was a man before his grandfather john do more's death received the information as above stated i have many apologies to offer for trespassing so long on your patience but i felt a natural desire if possible to correct what i conceive to be a groundless imputation on the memory of my ancestor before it shall come to be considered as a matter of history that he was a man of violent passions and singular temper i do not pretend to deny as many traditions still current in this country amply verify but that he was capable of forming a design to assassinate montrose the whole tenor of his former conduct and principles contradict that he was obliged to join the opposite party was merely a matter of safety while kilpont had so many powerful friends and connections able and ready to avenge his death i have only to add that you have my full permission to make what use of this communication you please and either to reject it altogether or allow it such credit as you think it deserves and i shall be ready at all times to furnish you with any further information on this subject which you may require and which it may be in my power to afford 
Ardvorlich, 15th January, 1830. The publication of a statement so particular, and probably so correct, is a debt due to the memory of James Stewart, the victim, it would seem, of his own violent passions, but perhaps incapable of an act of premeditated treachery. Abbotsford, 1st August, 1830. Introduction to Supplement Sergeant Moore McAlpin was, during his residence among us, one of the most honorable inhabitants of Ganderclough. No one thought of disputing his title to the great leathern chair on the coziest side of the chimney in the common room of the Wallace Arms on a Saturday evening. No less would our sexton, John Dward, have held it an unlicensed intrusion to suffer any one to induct himself into the corner of the left-hand pew nearest to the pulpit, which the sergeant regularly occupied on Sundays. There he sat, his blue invalid uniform brushed with the most scrupulous accuracy, two medals of merit displayed at his buttonhole, as well as the empty sleeve which should have been occupied by his right arm, bore evidence of his hard and honourable service. His weather-beaten features, his grey hair tied in a thin queue, in the military fashion of former days, and the right side of his head a little turned up, the better to catch the sound of the clergyman's voice, were all marks of his profession and infirmities. Beside him sat his sister Janet, a little, neat old woman, with a highland kerch and tartan plaid, watching the very looks of her brother, to her the greatest man upon earth, and actively looking out for him in his silver-clasped Bible, the text which the minister quoted or expounded. I believe it was the respect that was universally paid to this worthy veteran by all ranks in Ganderclough, which induced him to choose our village for his residence, for such was by no means his original intention. He had risen to the rank of sergeant-major of artillery by hard service in various quarters of the world, and was reckoned one of the most tried and trusty men of the Scotch train. A ball which shattered his arm in a peninsular campaign at length procured him an honourable discharge with an allowance from Chelsea and a handsome gratuity from the patriotic fund. Moreover, Sergeant Moore McAlpin had been prudent as well as valiant, and from prize money and savings had become master of a small sum in the three per cent consuls. He retired with the purpose of enjoying this income in the wild highland glen, in which, when a boy, he had herded black cattle and goats, ere the roll of the drum had made him cock his bonnet an inch higher, and follow its music for nearly forty years. To his recollection, this retired spot was unparalleled in beauty by the richest scenes he had visited in his wanderings. Even the happy valley of Rosselos would have sunk into nothing upon the comparison. He came, he revisited the loved scene. It was but a sterile glen, surrounded with rude crags, and traversed by a northern torrent. This was not the worst. The fires had been quenched upon thirty hearths. Of the cottage of his father's he could but distinguish a few rude stones. The language was almost extinguished. The ancient race from which he boasted his descent had found a refuge beyond the Atlantic. One Southland farmer, three grey-plaided shepherds, and six dogs now tenanted the whole glen, which in his youth had maintained in content, if not in competence, upwards of two hundred inhabitants. In the house of the new tenant, Sergeant McAlpin found, however, an unexpected source of pleasure and a means of employing his social affections. His sister Janet had fortunately entertained so strong a persuasion that her brother would one day return, that she had refused to accompany her kinsfolk upon their emigration. Nay, she had consented, though not without a feeling of degradation, to take service with the intruding lowlander, who, though a Saxon, she said, had proved a kind man to her. This unexpected meeting with his sister seemed a cure for all the disappointments 
which it had been sergeant moore's lot to encounter although it was not without a reluctant tear that he heard told as a highland woman alone could ten it the story of the expatriation of his kinsman she narrated at great length the vain offers they had made of advanced rent the payment of which must have reduced them to the extremity of poverty which they were yet contented to face for permission to live and die on their native soil nor did janet forget the portents which had announced the departure of the celtic race and the arrival of the strangers for two years previous to the emigration when the night wind howled down the pass of balacra its notes were distinctly modelled to the tune of ha till me tulit we return no more with which the emigrants usually bid farewell to their native shores the uncouth cries of the southland shepherds and the barking of their dogs were often heard in the midst of the hills long before their actual arrival a bard with the last of his race had commemorated the expulsion of the natives of the glen in a tune which brought tears into the aged eyes of the veteran and of which the first stanza may be thus rendered woe woe son of the lowlander why wilt thou leave thine own bonny border why comes thou hither disturbing the highlander wasting the glen that was once in fair order what added to sergeant moore mcalpin's distress upon the occasion was that the chief by whom this change had been effected was by tradition and common opinion held to represent the ancient leaders and fathers of the expelled fugitives and it had hitherto been one of sergeant moore's principal subjects of pride to prove by genealogical deduction in what degree of kindred he stood to this personage a woeful change was now wrought in his sentiments towards him i cannot curse him he said as he rose and strode through the room when janet's narrative was finished i will not curse him he is the descendant and representative of my fathers but never shall mortal men hear me name his name again and he kept his word for until his dying day no man heard him mention his selfish and hard-hearted chieftain after giving a day to sad recollections the hardy spirit which had carried him through so many dangers manned the sergeant's bosom against this cruel disappointment he would go he said to canada to his kinsfolk where they had named a transatlantic valley after the glen of their fathers janet he said should kilt her coats like a leaguer lady damn the distance it was a flea's leap to the voyages and marches he had made on a slighter occasion with this purpose he left the highlands and came with his sister as far as ganderclo on his way to glasgow to take a passage to canada but winter was now set in and as he thought it advisable to wait for a spring passage when the st lawrence should be open he settled among us for the few months of his stay in britain as we said before the respectable old man met with deference and attention from all ranks of society and when spring returned he was so satisfied with his quarters that he did not renew the purpose of his voyage janet was afraid of the sea and he himself felt the infirmities of age and hard service more than he had at first expected and as he confessed to the clergyman and my worthy principal mr cleishbotham it was better staying with kind friends than going farther and faring worse he therefore established himself and his domicile at ganderclo to the great satisfaction as we have already said of all its inhabitants to whom he became in respect of military intelligence and able commentaries upon the newspapers gazettes and bulletins a very oracle explanatory of all martial events past present or to come it is true the sergeant had his inconsistencies he was a steady jacobite his father and his four uncles having been out in the forty-five but he was a no less steady adherent of king george 
in whose service he had made his little fortune and lost three brothers so that you were in equal danger to displease him in terming prince charles the pretender or by saying anything derogatory to the dignity of king george further it must not be denied that when the day of receiving his dividends came round the sergeant was apt to tarry longer at the wallace arms of an evening than was consistent with strict temperance or indeed with his worldly interest for upon these occasions his competitors sometimes contrived to flatter his partialities by singing jacobite songs and drinking confusion to bonaparte and the health of the duke of wellington until the sergeant was not only flattered into paying the whole reckoning but occasionally induced to lend small sums to his interested companions after such sprays as he called them were over and his temper once more cool he seldom failed to thank god and the duke of york who had made it much more difficult for an old soldier to ruin himself by his folly than had been the case in his younger days it was not on such occasions that i made a part of sergeant moore mccalpin's society but often when my leisure would permit i used to seek him on what he called his morning and evening parade on which when the weather was fair he appeared as regularly as if summoned by tuck of drum his morning walk was beneath the elms in the churchyard for death he said had been his next-door neighbour for so many years that he had no apology for dropping the acquaintance his evening promenade was on the bleaching green by the riverside where he was sometimes to be seen on an open bench with spectacles on nose conning over the newspapers to a circle of village politicians explaining military terms and aiding the comprehension of his hearers by lines drawn on the ground with the end of his rattan on other occasions he was surrounded by a bevy of schoolboys whom he sometimes drilled to the manual and sometimes with less approbation on the part of their parents instructed in the mystery of artificial fireworks for in the case of public rejoicings the sergeant was pyrotechnist as the encyclopedia calls it to the village of ganderclough it was in his morning walk that i most frequently met with the veteran and i can hardly yet look upon the village footpath overshadowed by the row of lofty elms without thinking i see his upright form advancing towards me with measured step and his cane advanced ready to pay me the military salute but he is dead and sleeps with his faithful janet under the third of those very trees counting from the stile at the west corner of the churchyard the delight which i had in sergeant mccalpin's conversation related not only to his own adventures of which he had encountered many in the course of a wandering life but also to his recollection of numerous highland traditions in which his youth had been instructed by his parents and of which he would in after life have deemed it a kind of heresy to question the authenticity many of these belonged to the wars of montrose in which some of the sergeant's ancestry had it seems taken a distinguished part it has happened that although these civil commotions reflect the highest honour upon the highlanders being indeed the first occasion upon which they showed themselves superior or even equal to their low country neighbours in military encounters they have been less commemorated among them than any one would have expected judging from the abundance of traditions which they have preserved upon less interesting subjects it was therefore with great pleasure that i extracted from my military friend some curious particulars respecting that time they are mixed with that measure of the wild and wonderful which belongs to the period and the narrator but which i do not in the least object to the reader's treating with disbelief providing he will be so good as to give implicit credit to the natural events of the story which like all those which i have had the honour to put under his notice actually rest upon a basis of truth 
End of Introduction Section 1 of A Legend of Montrose This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brandon A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott Chapter 1 such as do build their faith upon the holy text of pike and gun decide all controversies by infallible artillery and prove their doctrine orthodox by apostolic blows and knocks butler it was during the period of that great and bloody civil war which agitated britain during the seventeenth century that our tale has its commencement. Scotland had as yet remained free from the ravages of intestine war, although its inhabitants were much divided in political opinions, and many of them, tired of the control of the estates of Parliament, and disapproving of the bold measure which they had adopted by sending into England a large army to the assistance of the Parliament, were determined on their part to embrace the earliest opportunity of declaring for the king, and making such a diversion as should at least compel the recall of General Leslie's army out of England, if it did not recover a great part of Scotland to the king's allegiance. This plan was chiefly adopted by the northern nobility, who had resisted with great obstinacy the adoption of the Solemn League and Covenant and by many of the chiefs of the highland clans, who conceived their interest and authority to be connected with royalty, who had, besides, a decided aversion to the Presbyterian form of religion, and who, finally, were in that half-savage state of society in which war is always more welcome than peace. Great commotions were generally expected to arise from these concurrent causes, and the trade of incursion and depredation, which the Scotch Highlanders at all times exercised upon the lowlands, began to assume a more steady, avowed, and systematic form, as part of a general military system. Those at the head of affairs were not insensible to the peril of the moment, and anxiously made preparations to meet and to repel it. They considered, however, with satisfaction, that no leader or name of consequence had as yet appeared to assemble an army of royalists, or even to direct the efforts of those desultory bands whom love of plunder, perhaps as much as political principle, had hurried into measures of hostility. It was generally hoped that the quartering of a sufficient number of troops in the lowlands adjacent to the highland line would have the effect of restraining the mountain chieftains, while the power of various barons in the north, who had espoused the covenant, as, for example, the Earl Marshal, the great families of Forbes, Leslie and Irvine, the Grants, and other Presbyterian clans, might counterbalance and bridle not only the strength of the Ogilvies and other cavaliers of Angus and King Cardine, but even the potent family of the Gordons, whose extensive authority was only equalled by their extreme dislike to the Presbyterian model. In the West Highlands, the ruling party numbered many enemies, but the power of these disaffected clans was supposed to be broken, and the spirit of their chieftains intimidated by the predominating influence of the Marquis of Argyle, upon whom the confidence of the Convention of Estates was reposed with the utmost security, and whose power in the Highlands, already exorbitant, had been still farther increased by concessions extorted from the king at the last pacification. It was indeed well known that Argyle was a man rather of political enterprise than personal courage and better calculated to manage an intrigue of state 
than to control the tribes of hostile mountaineers. Yet the numbers of his clan, and the spirit of the gallant gentleman by whom it was led, might, it was supposed, atone for the personal deficiencies of their chief. And as the Campbells had already severely humbled several of the neighboring tribes, it was supposed these would not readily again provoke an encounter with a body so powerful. Thus having at their command the whole west and south of Scotland, indisputably the richest part of the kingdom, Fashire being in a peculiar manner their own, and possessing many and powerful friends even north of the Forth and Tay, the Scottish Convention of Estates saw no danger sufficient to induce them to alter the line of policy they had adopted, or to recall from the assistance of their brethren of the English Parliament that auxiliary army of twenty thousand men, by means of which accession of strength the king's party had been reduced to the defensive, when in full career of triumph and success. The causes which moved the Convention of Estates at this time to take such an immediate and active interest in the Civil War of England are detailed in our historians, but may be here shortly recapitulated. They had indeed no new injury or aggression to complain of at the hand of the king, and the peace which had been made between Charles and his subjects of Scotland had been carefully observed but the Scottish rulers were well aware that this peace had been extorted from the king, as well by the influence of the parliamentary party in England as by the terror of their own arms. It is true, King Charles had since then visited the capital of his ancient kingdom, which had assented to the new organization of the church and had distributed honors and rewards among the leaders of the party which had shown themselves most hostile to his interests. But it was suspected that distinctions so unwillingly conferred would be resumed as soon as opportunity offered. The low state of the English Parliament was seen in Scotland with deep apprehension, and it was concluded that should Charles triumph by force of arms against his insurgent subjects of England, he would not be long in exacting from the Scotch the vengeance which he might suppose due to those who had set the example of taking up arms against him. Such was the policy of the measure which dictated the sending the auxiliary army into England, and it was avowed in a manifesto explanatory of their reasons for giving this timely and important aid to the English Parliament. The English Parliament, they said, had been already friendly to them, and might be so again. Whereas the king, although he had so lately established religion among them according to their desires, had given them no ground to confide in his royal declaration, seeing they had found his promises and actions inconsistent with each other. Our conscience, they concluded, and God, who is greater than our conscience, beareth us record that we aim altogether at the glory of God, peace of both nations, and honor of the king, in suppressing and punishing, in a legal way, those who are the troublers of Israel, the firebrands of hell, the Korahs, the Balaams, the Doegs, the Rabshakehs, the Hamans, the Tobias, the Sanballats of our time. Which done, we are satisfied. Neither have we begun to use a military expedition to England as a mean for compassing those our pious ends, until all other means which we could think upon have failed us. And this alone is left to us, ultimum et unicum remedium, the last and only remedy leaving it to causists to determine whether one contracting party is justified in breaking a solemn treaty, upon the suspicion that, in certain future contingencies, it might be infringed by the other, we shall proceed to mention two other circumstances that had at least equal influence with the Scottish rulers and nation, with any doubts which they entertained of the king's good faith. The first of these 
was the nature and condition of their army, headed by a poor and discontented nobility, under whom it was officered chiefly by Scottish soldiers of fortune, who had served in the German wars until they had lost almost all distinction of political principle, and even of country, in the adoption of the mercenary faith that a soldier's principal duty was fidelity to the state or sovereign from whom he received his pay, without respect either to the justice of the quarrel or to their own connection with either of the contending parties. To men of this stamp, Grotius applies the severe character, nullum vitae genos et improbius, quam eorum qui sine causae respectu mercede conducti militant. To these mercenary soldiers, as well as to the needy gentry with whom they were mixed in command, and who easily imbibed the same opinions, the success of the late short invasion of England in 1641 was a sufficient reason for renewing so profitable an experiment. The good pay and free quarters of England had made a feeling impression upon the recollection of these military adventurers, and the prospect of again levying eight hundred and fifty pounds a day came in place of all arguments, whether of state or of morality. Another cause inflamed the minds of the nation at large, no less than the tempting prospect of the wealth of England animated the soldiery. So much had been written and said on either side concerning the form of church government that it had become a matter of infinitely more consequence in the eyes of the multitude than the doctrines of that gospel which both churches had embraced. The prelatists and Presbyterians of the more violent kind became as illiberal as the papists and would scarcely allow the possibility of salvation beyond the pale of their respective churches. It was in vain remarked to these zealots that had the author of our holy religion considered any peculiar form of church government as essential to salvation, it would have been revealed with the same precision as under the Old Testament dispensation. Both parties continued as violent as if they could have pleaded the distinct commands of heaven to justify their intolerance. Laud, in the days of his domination, had fired the train by attempting to impose upon the Scottish people church ceremonies foreign to their habits and opinions. The success with which this had been resisted and the Presbyterian model substituted in its place, had endeared the latter to the nation, as the cause in which they had triumphed. The solemn league and covenant, adopted with such zeal by the greater part of the kingdom, and by them forced at the sword's point upon the others, bore in its bosom, as its principal object, the establishing of the doctrine and discipline of the Presbyterian Church and the putting down of all error and heresy, and having attained for their own country the establishment of this golden candlestick, the Scots became liberally and fraternally anxious to erect the same in England. This, they conceived, might be easily attained by lending to the Parliament the effectual assistance of the Scottish forces. The Presbyterians, a numerous and powerful party in the English Parliament, had hitherto taken the lead in opposition to the king, while the independents and other sectaries, who afterwards, under Cromwell, resumed the power of the sword and overset the Presbyterian model both in Scotland and England, were as yet contented to lurk under the shelter of the wealthier and more powerful party. The prospect of bringing to a uniformity the kingdoms of England and Scotland in discipline and worship seemed therefore as fair as it was desirable. The celebrated Sir Henry Vane, one of the commissioners who negotiated the alliance betwixt England and Scotland, saw the influence which this bait had upon the spirits of those with whom he dealt, and although himself a violent independent, 
he contrived at once to gratify and to elude the eager desires of the Presbyterians by qualifying the obligation to reform the Church of England as a change to be executed according to the word of God and the best reformed churches. Deceived by their own eagerness, themselves entertaining no doubts on the jus divinium of their ecclesiastical establishments, and not holding it possible such doubts could be adopted by others, the Convention of Estates and the Kirk of Scotland conceived that such expressions necessarily inferred the establishment of presbytery, nor were they undeceived, until, when their help was no longer needful, the sectaries gave them to understand that the phrase might as well be applied to independency or any other mode of worship, which those who were at the head of affairs at the time might consider as agreeable to the word of God and the practice of the Reformed churches. Neither were the outwitted Scottish less astonished to find that the designs of the English sectaries struck against the monarchical constitution of britain it having been their intention to reduce the power of the king but by no means to abrogate the office they fared however in this respect like rash physicians who commence by over physicking a patient until he is reduced to a state of weakness from which cordials are afterwards unable to recover him but these events were still in the womb of futurity as yet the scottish parliament held their engagement with england consistent with justice prudence and piety and their military undertaking seemed to succeed to their very wish the junction of the scottish army with those of fairfax and manchester enabled the parliamentary forces to besiege york and to fight the desperate action of long marston moor in which Prince Rupert and the Marquis of Newcastle were defeated. The Scottish auxiliaries, indeed, had less of the glory of this victory than their countrymen could desire. David Leslie, with their cavalry, fought bravely, and to them, as well as to Cromwell's brigade of independence, the honor of the day belonged. But the old Earl of Leven, the convenating general, was driven out of the field by the impetuous charge of Prince Rupert, and was thirty miles distant in full flight towards Scotland, when he was overtaken by the news that his party had gained a complete victory. The absence of these auxiliary troops, upon this crusade for the establishment of Presbyterianism in England, had considerably diminished the power of the Convention of Estates in Scotland and had given rise to those agitations among the anti-covenanters, which we have noticed at the beginning of this chapter. End of section 1section 2 of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter 2 his mother could for him as cradles sat her husband's rusty iron corselet whose jangling sound could hush her babe to rest that never plained of his uneasy nest then did he dream of dreary wars at hand and woke and fought and won ere he could stand hall's satires it was towards the close of a summer's evening during the anxious period which we have commemorated that a young gentleman of quality well mounted and armed and accompanied by two servants one of whom led a sumpter horse rode slowly up one of those steep passes by which the highlands are accessible from the lowlands of perthshire the beautiful pass of lenny near calendar in monteith would in some respects answer this description their course had lain for some time along the banks of a lake 
whose deep waters reflected the crimson beams of the western sun the broken path which they pursued with some difficulty was in some places shaded by ancient birches and oak trees and in others overhung by fragments of huge rock elsewhere the hill which formed the northern side of this beautiful sheet of water arose in steep but less precipitous acclivity and was arrayed in heath of the darkest purple in the present times a scene so romantic would have been judged to possess the highest charms for the traveller but those who journey in days of doubt and dread pay little attention to picturesque scenery the master kept as often as the wood permitted abreast of one or both of his domestics and seemed earnestly to converse with them probably because the distinctions of rank are readily set aside among those who are made to be sharers of common danger the dispositions of the leading men who inhabit this wild country and the probability of their taking part in the political convulsions that were soon expected were the subjects of their conversation they had not advanced above half-way up the lake and the young gentleman was pointing to his attendants the spot where their intended road turned northwards and leaving the verge of the loch ascended a ravine to the right hand when they discovered a single horseman coming down the shore as if to meet them the gleam of the sunbeams upon his headpiece and corslet showed that he was in armour and the purpose of the other travellers required that he should not pass unquestioned we must know who he is said the young gentleman and whither he is going and putting spurs to his horse he rode forward as fast as the rugged state of the road would permit followed by his two attendants until he reached the point where the pass along the side of the lake was intersected by that which descended from the ravine securing thus against the possibility of the stranger eluding them by turning into the latter road before they came up with him the single horseman had mended his pace when he first observed the three riders advance rapidly towards him but when he saw them halt and form a front which completely occupied the path he checked his horse and advanced with great deliberation so that each party had an opportunity to take a full survey of the other the solitary stranger was mounted upon an able horse fit for military service and for the great weight which he had to carry and his rider occupied his demipique or war saddle with an air that showed it was his familiar seat he had a bright burnished headpiece with a plume of feathers together with a cuirass thick enough to resist a musket ball and a back piece of lighter materials these defensive arms he wore over a buff jerkin along with a pair of gauntlets or steel gloves the tops of which reached up to his elbow and which like the rest of his armour were of bright steel at the front of his military saddle hung a case of pistols far beyond the ordinary size nearly two feet in length and carrying bullets of twenty to the pound a buff belt with a broad silver buckle sustained on one side a long straight double-edged broadsword with a strong guard and a blade calculated either to strike or push on the right side hung a dagger of about eighteen inches in length a shoulder belt sustained at his back a musketoon or blunderbuss and was crossed by a bandolier containing his charges of ammunition thigh pieces of steel then termed taslets met the tops of his huge jack-boots and completed the equipage of a well-armed trooper of the period the appearance of the horseman himself corresponded well with his military equipage to which he had the air of having been long inured he was above the middle size and of strength sufficient to bear with ease the weight of his weapons offensive and defensive his age might be forty and upwards and his countenance was that of a resolute weather-beaten veteran who had seen many fields and brought away in token more than one scar 
at the distance of about thirty yards he halted and stood fast raised himself on his stirrups as if to reconnoitre and ascertain the purpose of the opposite party and brought his musketoon under his right arm ready for use if occasion should require it in everything but numbers he had the advantage of those who seemed inclined to interrupt his passage the leader of the party was indeed well mounted and clad in a buff coat richly embroidered the half military dress of the period but his domestics had only coarse jackets of thick felt which could scarce be expected to turn the edge of a sword if wielded by a strong man and none of them had any weapons save swords and pistols without which gentlemen or their attendants during those disturbed times seldom stirred abroad when they had stood at gaze for about a minute the younger gentleman gave the challenge which was then common in the mouth of all strangers who met in such circumstances for whom are you tell me first answered the soldier for whom are you the strongest party should speak first we are for god and king charles answered the first speaker now tell your faction you know ours i am for god and my standard answered the single horseman and for which standard replied the chief of the other party cavalier or roundhead king or convention by my troth sir answered the soldier i would loath to reply to you with an untruth as a thing unbecoming a cavalier of fortune and a soldier but to answer your query with beseeming veracity it is necessary i should myself have resolved to whilk of the present divisions of the kingdom i shall ultimately adhere being a matter whereon my mind is not as yet precisely ascertained i should have thought answered the gentleman that when loyalty and religion are at stake no gentleman or man of honour could be long in choosing his party truly sir replied the trooper if ye speak in the way of vituperation as meaning to impugn my honour or gentility i would blithely put the same to issue venturing in that quarrel with my single person against you three but if you speak it in the way of logical ratiocination whilk i have studied in my youth at the marischal college of aberdeen i am ready to prove to ye logis that my resolution to defer for a certain season the taking upon me either of these quarrels not only becometh me as a gentleman and a man of honour but also as a person of sense and prudence one imbued with humane letters in his early youth and who from thenceforward has followed the wars under the banner of the invincible gustavus the lion of the north and under many other heroic leaders both lutheran and calvinist papist and arminian after exchanging a word or two with his domestics the younger gentleman replied i should be glad sir to have some conversation with you upon so interesting a question and should be proud if i can determine you in favour of the cause i have myself espoused i ride this evening to a friend's house not three miles distant whither if you choose to accompany me you shall have good quarters for the night and free permission to take your own road in the morning if you then feel no inclination to join with us whose word am i to take for this answered the cautious soldier a man must know his guarantee or he may fall into an ambuscade i am called answered the younger stranger the earl of menteith and i trust you will receive my honour as a sufficient security a worthy nobleman answered the soldier whose parole is not to be doubted with one motion he replaced his musketoon at his back and with another made his military salute to the young nobleman and continuing to talk as he rode forward to join him and i trust said he my own assurance that i will be bon camarado to your lordship in peace or in peril during the time we shall abide together will not be altogether vilipended in these doubtful times when as they say a man's head is safer in a still cap than in a marble palace i assure you sir said lord menteith 
that to judge from your appearance i most highly value the advantage of your escort but i trust we shall have no occasion for any exercise of valour as i expect to conduct you to good and friendly quarters good quarters my lord replied the soldier are always acceptable and are only to be postponed to good pay or good booty not to mention the honour of a cavalier or the needful points of commanded duty and truly my lord your noble proffer is not the less welcome in that i knew not precisely this night where i and my poor companion patting his horse were to find lodgments may i be permitted to ask then said lord menteith to whom i have the good fortune to stand quartermaster truly my lord said the trooper my name is dalgetty dugald dalgetty ritmaster dugald dalgetty of drumthwacket at your honourable service to command it is a name you may have seen in gallo belgicus the swedish intelligencer or if you read high dutch in the fliegenden mercator of Lipsick. my father my lord having by unthrifty courses reduced a fair patrimony to a nonentity i had no better shift when i was eighteen years old than to carry the learning whilk i had acquired at the marischal college of aberdeen my gentle bluid and designation of drumthwacket together with a pair of stalwart arms and legs conform to the german wars there to push my way as a cavalier of fortune my lord my legs and arms stood me in more stead than either my gentle kin or my booklear and i found myself trailing a pike as a private gentleman under old sir ludovic leslie where i learned the rules of service so tightly that i will not forget them in a hurry sir i have been made to stand guard eight hours being from twelve at noon to eight o'clock of the night at the palace armed with back and breast headpiece and bracelets being ironed to the teeth in a bitter frost and the ice was as hard as ever was flint and all for stopping an instant to speak to my landlady when i should have gone to roll-call and doubtless sir replied lord menteith you have gone through some hot service as well as this same cold duty you talk of surely my lord it doth not become me to speak but he that hath seen the fields of Lipsig and of lutzen may be said to have seen pitched battles and one who hath witnessed the intaking of frankfurt and spanheim and nuremberg and so forth should know somewhat about leaguers storms onslaughts and outfalls but your merit sir and experience were doubtless followed by promotion it came slow my lord doom slow replied dalgetty but as my scottish countrymen the fathers of the war and the raisers of those valorous scottish regiments that were the dread of germany began to fall pretty thick what with pestilence and what with the sword why we their children succeeded to their inheritance sir i was six years first private gentleman of the company and three years lance spicy disdaining to receive a halberd as unbecoming my birth wherefore i was ultimately promoted to be a fondragger as the high dutch call it which signifies an ancient in the king's leaf regiment of black horse and thereafter i arose to be lieutenant and ritmaster under that invisible monarch the bulwark of the protestant faith the lion of the north the terror of austria gustavus the victorious and yet if i understand you captain dalgetty i think that rank corresponds with your foreign title of ritmaster the same grade precisely answered dalgetty ritmaster signifying literally file leader i was observing continued lord menteith that if i understood you right you had left the service of this great prince it was after his death it was after his death sir said dalgetty when i was in no shape bound to continue mine adherence there are things my lord in that service that cannot but go against the stomach of any cavalier of honour in especial albeit the pay be none of the most superabundant 
being only about sixty dollars a month to a ripmaster yet the invincible gustavus never paid above one-third of that sum whilk was distributed monthly by way of loan although when justly considered it was in fact a borrowing by that great monarch of the additional two-thirds which were due to the soldier and i have seen some whole regiments of dutch and holsteiners mutiny on the field of battle like base scullions crying out gelt gelt signifying their desire of pay instead of falling to blows like our noble scottish blades who ever disdained my lord postponing of honour to filthy lucre but were not these arrears said lord menteith paid to the soldiery at some stated period my lord said dalgetty i take it on my conscience that at no period and by no possible process could one crutzer of them ever be recovered i myself never saw twenty dollars of my own all the time i served the invincible gustavus unless it was from the chance of a storm or victory or the fetching in some town or dorp when a cavalier of fortune who knows the usage of wars seldom faileth to make some small profit i begin rather to wonder sir said lord menteith that you should have continued so long in the swedish service than that you should have ultimately withdrawn from it neither i should answered the ripmaster but that great leader captain and king the lord of the north and the bulwark of the protestant faith had a way of winning battles taking towns overrunning countries and levying contributions whilk made his service irresistibly delectable to all true-bred cavaliers who follow the noble profession of arms simple as i ride here my lord i have myself commanded the whole stift of dunkelspiel on the lower rhine occupying the palsgrave's palace consuming his choice wines with my comrades calling in contributions requisitions and cotowacs and not failing to lick my fingers as became a good cook but truly all this glory hastened to decay after our great master had been shot with three bullets on the field of lutzen wherefore finding that fortune had changed sides that the borrowings and lendings went on as before out of our pay while the cadjuacs and casualties were all cut off i even gave up my commission and took service with wallenstein in walter butler's irish regiment and may i beg to know of you said lord menteith apparently interested in the adventures of this soldier of fortune how you liked this change of masters indifferent well said the captain very indifferent well i cannot say that the emperor paid much better than the great gustavus for hard knocks we had plenty of them i was often obliged to run my head against my old acquaintances the swedish feathers whilk your honour must conceive to be double pointed stakes shod with iron at each end and planted before the squad of pikes to prevent an onfall of the cavalry the whilk swedish feathers although they look gay to the eye resembling the shrubs or lesser trees of a forest as the puissant pikes arranged in battalia behind them correspond to the tall pines thereof yet nevertheless are not altogether so soft to encounter as the plumage of a goose howbeit in despite of heavy blows and light pay the cavalier of fortune may thrive indifferently well in the imperial service in respect his private casualties are nothing so closely looked to as by the swede and so that an officer did his duty on the field neither wallenstein nor pappenheim nor old tilly before them would likely listen to the objurgations of boers or burghers against any commander or soldado by whom they chanced to be somewhat closely shorn so that an experienced cavalier knowing how to lay as our scottish phrase runs the head of the sow to the tail of the grice might get out of the country the pay whilk he could not obtain from the emperor with a full hand sir doubtless and with interest said lord menteith indubitably my lord answered dalgetty composedly 
for it would be doubly disgraceful for any soldado of rank to have his name called in question for any petty delinquency and pray sir continued lord menteith what made you leave so gainful a service why truly sir answered the soldier an irish cavalier called o'killigan being major of our regiment and i having had words with him the night before respecting the worth and precedence of our several nations it pleased him the next day to deliver his orders to me with the point of his batoon advanced and held aloof instead of declining and trailing the same as is the fashion from a courteous commanding officer towards his equal in rank though it may be his inferior in military grade upon this quarrel sir we fought in private rencontre and as in the perquisitions which followed it pleased walter butler our oberst or colonel to give the lighter punishment to his countrymen and the heavier to me whereupon ill stomaching such partiality i exchanged my commission for one under the spaniard i hope you found yourself better off by the change said lord menteith in good sooth answered the ritmaster i had but little to complain of the pay was somewhat regular being furnished by the rich flemings and walloons of the low country the quarters were excellent the good wheaten loaves of the flemings were better than the provent rye bread of the swede and rhenish wine was more plenty with us than ever i saw the black beer of rostock in gustavus's camp service there was none duty there was little and what little we might do or leave undone at our pleasure an excellent retirement for a cavalier somewhat weary of field and leaguer who had purchased with his blood as much honour as might serve his turn and was desirous of a little ease and good living and may i ask said lord menteith why you captain being as i suppose in the situation you describe retired from the spanish service also you are to consider my lord that your spaniard replied captain dalgetty is a person altogether unparalleled in his own conceit wherethrough he maketh not fit account of such foreign cavaliers of valour as are pleased to take service with him and a galling thing it is to every honourable soldado to be put aside and postponed and obliged to yield preference to every puffing seigneur who were it the question which should first mount a breach at push of pike might be apt to yield willing place to a scottish cavalier moreover sir i was pricked in conscience respecting a matter of religion i should not have thought captain dalgetty said the young nobleman that an old soldier who had changed service so often would have been too scrupulous on that head no more i am my lord said the captain since i hold it to be the duty of the chaplain of the regiment to settle those matters for me and every other brave cavalier inasmuch as he does nothing else that i know of for his pay and allowances but this was our particular case my lord a casus improvisus as i may say in whilk i had no chaplain of my own persuasion to act as my adviser i found in short that although my being a protestant might be winked at in respect that i was a man of action and had more experience than all the dons in our tertia put together yet when in garrison it was expected i should go to mass with the regiment now my lord as a true scottish man and educated at the marischal college of aberdeen i was bound to uphold the mass to be an act of blinded papistry and utter idolatry whilk i was altogether unwilling to homologate by my presence true it is that i consulted on the point with a worthy countryman of my own one father fadsides of the scottish covenant in wardsburg and i hope observed lord menteith you obtained a clear opinion from this same ghostly father as clear as it could be replied captain dalgetty considering we had drunk six flasks of rhenish and about two munchkins of kirschenwasser 
father fatsides informed me that as nearly as he could judge for a heretic like myself it signified not much whether i went to mass or not seeing my eternal perdition was signed and sealed at any rate in respect of my impenitent and obdurate perseverance in my damnable heresy being discouraged by this response i applied to a dutch pastor of the reformed church who told me he thought i might lawfully go to mass in respect that the prophet permitted naaman a mighty man of valour and an honourable cavalier of syria to follow his master into the house of ryman a false god or idol to whom he had vowed service and to bow down when the king was leaning upon his hand but neither was this answer satisfactory to me both because there was an unco difference between an anointed king of syria and our spanish colonel whom i could have blown away like the peeling of an ingan and chiefly because i could not find the thing was required of me by any of the articles of war neither was i proffered any consideration either in perquisite or pay for the wrong i might thereby do to my conscience so you again changed your service said lord menteith in troth i did my lord and after trying for a short while two or three other powers i even took on for a time with their high mightinesses the states of holland and how did their service jump with your humour again demanded his companion oh my lord said the soldier in a sort of enthusiasm their behaviour on payday might be a pattern to all europe no borrowings no lendings no offsets no arrears all balanced and paid like a banker's book the quarters too are excellent and the allowances unchallengeable but then sir they are a procis scrupulous people and will allow nothing for peccadilloes so that if a boar complains of a broken head or a beer-seller of a broken can or a daft wench does but squeak loud enough to be heard above her breath a soldier of honour shall be dragged not before his own court-martial who can best judge and punish his demerits but before a base mechanical burgomaster who shall menace him with the rasp-house the cord and what not as if he were one of their own mean amphibious twenty breeched boars so not being able to dwell longer among those ungrateful plebeians who although unable to defend themselves by their proper strength will nevertheless allow the noble foreign cavalier who engages with them nothing beyond his dry wages which no honourable spirit will put in competition with a liberal licence and honourable countenance i resolved to leave the service of the mynheers and hearing at this time to my exceeding satisfaction that there is something to be doing this summer in my way in this my dear native country i am come hither as they say like a beggar to a bridal in order to give my loving countrymen the advantage of that experience which i have acquired in foreign parts so your lordship has an outline of my brief story excepting my deportment in those passages of action in the field in leaguers storms and onslaughts whilk would be wearisome to narrate and might peradventure better befit any other tongue than mine own end of chapter two section three of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter three for pleas of right let statesmen vex their head battles my business and my guerdon bread and with the sordid switzer i can say the best of causes is the best of pay done the difficulty and narrowness of the road had by this time become such as to interrupt the conversation of the travellers and lord menteith reining back his horse 
held a moment's private conversation with his domestics the captain who now led the van of the party after about a quarter of a mile's slow and toilsome advance up a broken and rugged ascent emerged into an upland valley to which a mountain stream acted as a drain and afforded sufficient room upon its greensward banks for the travellers to pursue their journey in a more social manner lord menteith accordingly resumed the conversation which had been interrupted by the difficulties of the way i should have thought said he to captain dalgetty that a cavalier of your honourable mark who hath so long followed the valiant king of sweden and entertained such a suitable contempt for the base mechanical states of holland would not have hesitated to embrace the cause of king charles in preference to that of the low-born round-headed canting knaves who are in rebellion against his authority ye speak reasonably my lord said dalgetty and caterus paribus i might be induced to see the matter in the same light but my lord there is a southern proverb fine words butter no parsnips i have heard enough since i came here to satisfy me that a cavalier of honour is free to take any part in this civil embroilment while he may find most convenient for his own peculiar loyalty is your password my lord liberty roars another shield from the other side of the strath the king shouts one war cry the parliament roars another montrose for ever cries donald waving his bonnet argyle and levin cries a south country saunders vaporing with his hat and feather fight for the bishops says a priest with his gown and rochet stand stout for the kirk cries a minister in a geneva cap and band good watchwords all excellent watchwords whilk cause is the best i cannot say but sure am i that i have fought knee-deep in blood many a day for one that was ten degrees worse than the worst of them all and pray captain dalgetty said his lordship since the pretensions of both parties seem to you so equal will you please to inform us by what circumstances your preference will be determined simply upon two considerations my lord answered the soldier being first on which side my services would be in most honourable request and secondly whilk is a corollary of the first by whilk party they are likely to be most gratefully requited and to deal plainly with you my lord my opinion at present doth on both points rather incline to the side of the parliament your reasons if you please said lord menteith and perhaps i may be able to meet them with some others which are more powerful sir i shall be amenable to reason said captain dalgetty supposing it addresses itself to my honour and my interest well then my lord here is a sort of highland host assembled or expected to assemble in these wild hills in the king's behalf now sir you know the nature of our highlanders i will not deny them to be a people stout in body and valiant in heart and courageous enough in their own wild way of fighting which is as remote from the usages and discipline of war as ever was that of the ancient scythians or of the savage indians of america that now is they have na say mickle as a german whistle or a drum to beat a march an alarm a charge a retreat a reveille or the tattoo or any other point of war and their damnable skirlin pipes whilk they themselves pretend to understand are unintelligible to the ears of any cavaliero accustomed to civilized warfare so that were i undertaking to discipline such a breechless mob it were impossible for me to be understood and if i were understood judge ye my lord what chance i had of being obeyed among a band of half savages who are accustomed to pay to their own lairds and chiefs alenarly that respect and obedience whilk ought to be paid to commissionate officers if i were teaching them to form battalia 
by extracting the square root that is by forming your square battalion of equal number of men of rank and file corresponding to the square root of the full number present what return could i expect for communicating this golden secret of military tactic except it may be a dirk in my wam on placing some mcallister more mishimi or caperfay in the flank or rear when he claimed to be in the van truly well saith holy writ if ye cast pearls before swine they will turn again and rend ye i believe anderson said lord menteith looking back to one of his servants for both were close behind him you can assure this gentleman we shall have more occasion for experienced officers and be more disposed to profit by their instructions than he seems to be aware of with your honour's permission said anderson respectfully raising his cap when we are joined by the irish infantry who are expected and who should be landed in the west highlands before now we shall have need of good soldiers to discipline our levies and i should like well very well to be employed in such service said dalgetty the irish are pretty fellows very pretty fellows i desire to see none better in the field i once saw a brigade of irish at the taking of frankfort upon the odour stand to it with sword and pike till they beat off the blue and yellow swedish brigades esteemed as stout as any that fought under the immortal gustavus and although stout hepburn valiant lumsdale courageous monroe with myself and other cavaliers made entry elsewhere at point of pike yet had we all met with such opposition we had returned with great loss and little profit wherefore these valiant irishes being all put to the sword as is usual in such cases did nevertheless gain immortal praise and honour so that for their sakes i have always loved and honoured those of that nation next to my own country of scotland a command of irish said menteith i think i could almost promise you should you be disposed to embrace the royal cause and yet said captain dalgetty my second and greatest difficulty remains behind for although i hold it a mean and sordid thing for a soldado to have nothing in his mouth but pay and gelt like the base cullions the german lonsnechts whom i mentioned before and although i will maintain it with my sword that honour is to be preferred before pay free quarters and arrears yet ex contrario a soldier's pay being the counterpart of his engagement of service it becomes a wise and considerate cavalier to consider what remuneration he is to receive for his service and from what funds it is to be paid and truly my lord from what i can see and hear the convention are the purse-masters the highlanders indeed may be kept in humour by allowing them to steal cattle and for the irishes your lordship and your noble associates may according to the practice of the wars in such cases pay them as seldom or as little as may suit your pleasure or convenience but the same mode of treatment doth not apply to a cavalier like me who must keep up his horses servants arms and equipage and who neither can nor will go to warfare upon his own charges anderson the domestic who had before spoken now respectfully addressed his master i think my lord he said that under your lordship's favour i could say something to remove captain dalgetty's second objection also he asks us where we are to collect our pay now in my poor mind the resources are as open to us as to the covenanters they tax the country according to their pleasure and dilapidate the estates of the king's friends now were we once in the lowlands with our highlanders and our irish at our backs and our swords in our hands we can find many a fat trader whose ill-gotten wealth shall fill our military chest and satisfy our soldiery besides confiscations will fall in thick 
and in giving donations of forfeited lands to every adventurous cavalier who joins his standard the king will at once reward his friends and punish his enemies in short he that joins these roundhead dogs may get some miserable pittance of pay he that joins our standard has a chance to be knight lord or earl if luck serve him have you ever served my good friend said the captain to the spokesman a little sir in these our domestic quarrels answered the man modestly but never in germany or the low countries said dalgetty i never had the honour answered anderson i profess said dalgetty answering lord menteith your lordship's servant has a sensible natural pretty idea of military matters somewhat irregular though and smells a little too much of selling the bear's skin before he has hunted him i will take the matter however into my consideration do so captain said lord menteith you will have the night to think of it for we are now near the house where i hope to ensure you a hospitable reception and that is what will be very welcome said the captain for i have tasted no food since daybreak but a farrel of oat-cake which i divided with my horse so i have been fain to draw my sword-belt three boars tighter for very extenuation lest hunger and heavy iron should make the gird slip End of chapter 3